I'm going to teach you a little Swahili this morning. The word karibu, it means welcome. Can you say it together? Karibu. karibu. You're pretty good at that. It's the 12th most spoken language in the world. Swahili, you've already become more bilingual today. Let's say it together. Karibu. Exactly. Now, when do you use that word? And it's always appropriate to know when to use a word and to use it appropriately. That would be in the context of someone coming to your home. For in the African tradition, in the tradition of those Swahili speakers, it's appropriate to yell, Hodi, Hodi, Hodi. That means sort of knock, 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 because quite often in the mud hut, there's no place to knock on your door. And the dwellings places may be uh, very simple, and so it's appropriate to come up to the door. And as you come near, about 15, 20 feet away, start yelling, Hodi, Hodi. Hodi, that's not howdy, that's a southern, but hodi, 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 meaning uh, can I come in, can I come close, and Karibu says, come near, welcome, come near, come on in, in other words, y'all come, as if you're from southern Kenya, uh, there we go, so it would be all that kind of idea that it's a welcoming spirit, so it is, as we think that every day, there should be a period in our lives in which we close our eyes, and go within and invite God to come in. Where we say, Karibu, where we say, come near, come in. It's not so much that we're saying that God is distant or removed or God is somewhere out there outside of us, but that an invitation of God coming within is coming within our consciousness, coming within our awareness, for the presence of God is already there within you. For that presence dwells within you. The Spirit of God is there within each and every one at all times, but there needs to be a time when it's rising up into our consciousness, into our thinking. Quite often we may go through the day and we're not always conscious of everything that's going on. Sometimes in life, it's because we're not always aware of the things around us, things go by and we didn't pay any attention. We don't have them rising up into our thinking or into our higher consciousness into our awareness, like very uh, uh, traveling with Dr. David Carter. He is the deer whisperer, and so he's always conscious of deer, no matter where we may be. And sometimes we've been traveling together to a co conference or something, and he'll say, I know there's deer here. And I'm going, wait, deer, what are you talking about? And all of a sudden, there's, well, spotting deer. Suddenly, then everyone in the vehicle is becoming deer conscious, and we've risen it up into our consciousness that someone else is calling. Anne was in the car. I see deer. Oh, there's deer over there. Suddenly we become more aware. Why? Because we are holding it in consciousness or rising it up within our thinking. So this is why it's important. We, we welcome this experience of the divine, an invitation for God to come into our thinking, into our consciousness, that we might be fully aware of the divine presence with us, around us, moving through us and always for us at every single moment of our day. It's really important because this consciousness is a state of mind which enables us to see clearly the things of God. Because this distracted mind, that's got all kinds of other things, you know, we can't see anything. We can't see clearly the spiritual realm. We can't see clearly that God is at work or that God is speaking, that God is always around us. And so quite often we are my thinking, uh, wait a minute, I didn't really experience God today. And I tell you, there's been times in my 41 years of pastoral ministry, people would say, you know, I went to church, but God wasn't there. I didn't feel God there. I didn't feel the presence of the Lord there. I didn't connect. And the same service, someone else would say, whoa, I felt the presence of the Lord there. I felt connection with God. I felt really uh, an amazing experience. This was really a powerful experience in the presence of the Lord. Well, it's because someone has risen or welcomed and said karibu in spirit come near i want to rise this uh, within me to a higher level of consciousness and so it is then they said wow i've been in tune i've heard the voice of god i've had these wonderful experiences where the divine is unfolding for me and how powerful that is for our life because i want to tell you this the spirit of god is speaking every single day that's right every single day and every moment God is speaking and wanting to speak to you who this voice of God is like a mighty wind rushing through our world today. The voice of God is ever rushing, not in a 
thundering way, but in that sweet and simple whispering of the divine trying to tell you and unfold for you insight, wisdom, instruction, guidance for your life. But when we're not there welcoming the spirit, welcoming it into our consciousness, we miss out. We don't always hear everything that's being said. How many of you have been distracted and you don't always hear what everything is being said in your home from your husband, your wife, your partner? How many of you do that selectively? Uh, and you say, you know, um, oh, I didn't hear take out the trash. I'm sorry. Did I? Did you say that? You know, I didn't hear this or that. Uh, yeah. Well, when we are not always fully in tune with what's going on, but distracted, maybe we're watching the television, reading, doing some sort of hobby or activity, and we're not really paying attention to what's going on. And what we hear is wah, 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 in the background. And so we don't always pay and we are always engaged in it. But then there's these moments. When you're sitting on the edge of every word your beloved is saying, especially when they're saying, you are so special. I love you. Oh, what? What? I heard that. Yeah, but I want you to say it again. You know, when they're saying these sweet nothings and they're whispering all these good words and compliments, oh, suddenly we can hear every single word, can't we? We're in tune. We have break into that awareness that suddenly it's risen to a higher level within us. And this is exactly what we're talking about as we want to draw near to this presence, elevating it within our daily thought of our consciousness. That thought that are going through your mind, 60,000 some thoughts a single day. How many of them are surrounded around God? Well, we'd like to think, how about one, maybe two? How about 10? Wouldn't it be lovely if all 60,000 were filled with the divine essence of the goodness of God? Every thought was unfolding God's goodness. For God is omnipresent, always present. And the moment we open up the door and we say, Karibu, we say, welcome, come near. When we open up the door of our heart and our mind, when we open up the door of our conscious, something amazing happens. God floods in. It's like all of the divine comes rushing into us. How many of you have been shopping on Black Friday and you have been outside Best Buy waiting for the latest bargain with that lineup of people who've been camping out to get that bargain, waiting for that special deal. And they're lining up at the door. And then you finally, the moment comes when the door is about to be open and they're actually pressing their noses against the glass. And there's almost no room to breathe. There's a crowd gathering and the employers say, employees, get ready. We're about to open the door get ready for the flood to happen. You know, it's that kind of thing. They unleash the doors and, oh, and shoppers come in like crazy, pushing everyone and flooding the room with retail purchasing. You see, well, you know, Ralph's in retail. You've experienced that, haven't you? You see, this is the way it is when we open our heart, our mind, our consciousness. When we open the door, open the door to the very presence of God, it just Floods in, it rushes in, it comes in like a mighty force in this loving context, filling us with a greater awareness, filling us with an understanding, filling us with wisdom, filling us with truth. What comes in is this grace of God. It floods in our lives. Grace, what is this? It's unmerited favor. You didn't have to earn it. You don't have to do something for it. It's already God's great gift to you. You know, no matter what you do, no matter how, what your day has been, no matter what your journey has been about, no matter what you've been saying or doing, this unmerited favor, this great grace is there for you. And in this grace is this powerful wisdom that comes to us, that gives us the unfolding power of awareness of our recognition, of our declaration, of our prayer request that comes in the form of a declaration, that comes in the form of a recognition of God's unfolding for us. This wisdom is there for us. This great grace is there. What if our daily prayer was this? Spirit, I know you are knocking at my door, the door of my consciousness, and I'm opening my consciousness to take over my mind and my body. Whoa, what a prayer that would be. Can you imagine inviting that, saying, Karibu, 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 Spirit, draw near. Spirit, come into my life. Take over my consciousness. Take over my thinking today. Fill me with the awareness of your divine presence. Let it be so that not only you are in 
full uh, operation within all of my thought life, but also within my body. Every aspect of my life is filled with the divine because I welcome it. I welcome it. And suddenly what happens is there's a powerful transformation within us that we then find ourselves taking this higher step of letting God fill our minds and bodies that it unfolds God's purpose. God's purpose. What is God's purpose? And sometimes they're thinking, oh, wait a minute. What about my purpose? What about my issues? And then there's God's purpose. And we get this so confused because we kind of think, oh, you know, God's purpose is going to be no fun. God's purpose is going to be so sacred and holy and churchy and all this kind of stuff. It won't unfold anything of goodness, you know, and fun for me and fulfillment of joy in my life. But instead, God's purpose is what? Your highest and best. That's right. That's what God's purpose is for you. That purpose is full of love and grace and happiness and joy. So why don't we just begin our day saying, God, I want your purpose to unfold in my consciousness. I want your purpose, your divine will, your desire, the desire of love and grace to work within me to the fullest extent. And I don't want it to be there to be any kind of hindrances. What happens then is something great happens within our lives. We find ourselves governed, led by something that is a higher influence in our life. How wonderful it is to be just sort of led by. Or, you know how it is? I love sometimes just to be the passenger of the car. You know, not always having to drive. I love to relax. There's something wonderful about someone else driving and you get to be chauffeured around. Isn't it lovely? Uh, why is it the wealthy always love that? They love to relax. They love this chauffeur-driven experience. They want their limo to be uh, driven by a driver. They don't have to worry about the street signs and the traffic. They don't have to worry about the uh, car and, and driving it. They, they get to relax and maybe enjoy and engage. And that's the same thing that happens to us in our spiritual life. When we allow God to come in and sort of do the driving, and we get to be the passenger. And we allow the influence of the divine to be working in our thoughts, in our everyday planning, in our everyday experience, that we discover this wonderful experience then of perfect peace unfolding for us, for God is in the driver's seat. Now, here's the thing. I want to make sure that you understand this very clearly, that even though God may be in the driver's seat, God is not controlling. God is not controlling. We may think, that God is, oh, we say God is in control when we surrender. But remember that surrender is a choice. You had to make that choice. God doesn't say, I'm in control whether you like it or not. I've made the choice for you. No, God waits for you to make the choice. So that surrender, that choice to open the door, that choice to say, Karibu, come near, that choice is yours and it's within you. For God is not in controlling, but God is then leading. As you offer the surrender or the permission, as you offer the awareness, as you allow the divine to rise in your consciousness. You see, we find this all through scripture, and we love the 23rd Psalm and its beautiful pictures, don't we? The Lord is my shepherd. We find it so uh, beautiful to see this beautiful word picture of a shepherd leading the sheep and guiding the sheep. But well, we find here that the great shepherd leads, but doesn't control. In fact, there's a passage in Scripture that says, Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. They comfort me. Oh, we get this a little confused. We think, wait a minute. The shepherd has a rod. Bang! The shepherd has a staff. I'm going to pull on him. I'm going to beat those sheep. I'm going to whip those sheep. The good shepherd is a loving, leading force, an entity, an energy this divine wisdom that unfolds for us for our highest and best. It's not a punishing. It's not a whipping. It's not a beating. It's not a destructive. It's not a, a, a create suffering kind of energy at all. Well, let's look at really understanding this Bible symbolism that was so beautifully used. For when the ancient times, a shepherd would have a rod and a staff. Those are the only things or tools that the shepherd would have didn't have all kinds of mechanisms or modern tools or conveniences that we may say, didn't drive through the fields in a Ford F-150 and with the radio blaring and to the latest tunes and having horns to honk at the sheep and 
or maybe dogs to help along, but all alone, a shepherd boy would have a rod and a staff. And the rod was in the shepherd's hand to do something amazing. The rod was used to count the sheep. Now, the shepherd's responsibility is to make sure all the sheep were together and in the fold, all the sheep collectively together. So the rod would be used to count, counting out one, two, three, four. And it would be so that even the counting process would be extending the rod out and allowing the sheep to pass under the rod as they maybe move through out of a corral or out of an open space into another area. So there's this wonderful expression that's found in Ezekiel 20 in the scripture. I will cause you to pass under the rod and I will bring to you the bond of the covenant. In other words, that's very symbolic for the ancients understood the shepherd's work of holding out the rod and the sheep being counted as the rod was there. And you and I are being counted by the spirit and presence of the divine. Counted, not controlled, but counted and said, I'm aware. I'm aware of your presence. I'm fully aware of you and who you are. I count you as one of my own. And the loving shepherd, the divine presence, does this wonderful work of awareness. And along with that, that rod is used as ex for an examination tool. Because as the sheep passed under the rod, the shepherd would look at the sheep and examine the wool, examine the body of the sheep itself to detect any disease or wounds or any defects. Because an example could be at one of these today's contemporary sheep shows, you can actually cut a sheep to hide all kinds of, you know, cut their wool, hide all kinds of problems, uh, defects, disease, illness. And so sometimes it can be that the shepherd would take the rod and re-examine the sheep's wool to determine the condition of the skin of the sheep itself, the cleanliness of the fleece, and the conformational shape of the body. So that's where the expression one just does not pull the wool over the judge's eye. You ever get that, hear that expression? Don't be pulling the wool over our eyes. What's the idea? The idea that a sheep could be cut in a way that would be deceptive and deceiving. So this scriptural context is that the rod, the rod of God is there that looks over and examines and is fully aware of every aspect of your life. And that the good shepherd is there with this rod and staff to lead and guide, not control, but to lead and guide in this wonderful way. Now, the staff itself, the staff is used to guide the sheep. It's there again as a tool where sometimes as the sheep are moving through, there's this little tap, tap, tap. Come on, over here. Come on over here. I'm going to corral you in. Come on, let's move along. It's there in a sense of guidance. So we find the word of God, the truth of God being also offered to us as a rod and a staff to guide us. That's why we talk a lot in our classes about when you're raising your children, you've often heard the phrase or the scripture says, spare the rod and spoil the child. And we think that means whip the dickens out of our kids, uh, lest we, they be spoiled. And the more we whip and punish them, the more we take a stick to their hind end and beat them till they're black and blue, the better that child will be. And we think, well, that's the Bible. No, it isn't. That's punishment, and that's your own parental frustration being taken out on your child. Because what it's actually saying is when you spare the rod, the rod and the staff are tools to guide you. They're, they're loving instruments. So when you spare the guidance to a child, you'll spoil the child. You've seen a lot of kids who have no guidance, no direction. You know, they just sit in front of a television and play video games all day, and there's no instruction for this child, and they're so spoiled. Come to dinner. Oh, no, I don't want to come to dinner, Mom. I'm just going to play video games all day long. And they become so spoiled. They have no regiment. They have no routine. They have no instruction. They have no guidance. They're spoiled. So you see this wonderful power of analogy is there. For the ancients understood the idea of a shepherd and the principles of the rod and the staff. And for us to understand that, to make this contemporary application for our lives, we too must understand that the Spirit of God is there to guide you, lead you, lovingly direct you. But you have to open the door. You have to say, Karibu, 
You have to say, come near. You have to offer that expression every single day that says, I go within and I raise in my thought, my consciousness, my awareness. The divine presence is at work within me now, within my mind, within my body. Because let me tell you this. Nothing can happen to us except through our consciousness. Nothing's going to happen to you if you're not aware of it, right? When I was a little kid, my parents on Saturday night was bath night. So, you know, they were frugal. And so quite often they would run the bathtub full of about this much water. And my older brother would be the first one in the tub. Then when the water got a little cold and he was done with his bath, they would pour a little bit more hot water in the tub. And my sister would have her bath. And then me being the youngest, they pour a little bit more hot water in the tub, and I would have the joyous time of being the last one to bathe. Oh, I was so excited because I got the deepest water. Woo! And I could play with all my boats and my rubber duckies and all the, and I could have so much fun and all this kind of thing. Years later, we looked at it and go, do you realize how dirty that water was? That was nasty. And we're like, ah, but I wasn't aware of that, right? I wasn't aware. All I could think of was, I got the blessing of being the last one. My whole idea was, okay, this is really exciting. The deepest water is mine. And though I got the most tub, the tub time, you know, because there was no child after me, and I could just enjoy all this wonderful bath water. I never thought about it being gross, dirty, nasty, kind of filthy thing. I just thought, hey, I got a real great blessing. Nothing can happen except through our consciousness. So I saw nothing wrong with it whatsoever. I saw no problems with I thought this was a blessing, right? Now, now today I'm conscious of that. I'm thinking, my sister and I laugh and said, hey, you want to take a bath after me? I'm like, no, 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 no. That's our little family joke because we realize suddenly we're aware, right? Years ago, I lived in Dar Salaam, and I had a fabulous house in on the coastal regions of the Indian Ocean. And in the center of the yard was this beautiful, tall mango tree that every year produces delicious, wonderful mangoes. Lived in that house for years and enjoyed my ministry and my work there. One day, uh, we were prepared to move, and we were moving across town to another house. And as we left that house, we left our little corgi dog named Poopy, which means Shorty in Swahili, left little Poopy behind. We came by to get him the next day, and he had been bitten by a poisonous snake, and he died. And the people who had just moved into the house said, we're so sorry, we were taking care of your dog, but unfortunately, he got bit by a snake. We didn't realize that there were snakes around this house. I said, snakes? I never saw snakes. Oh, yes. You see, we're going to cut down this mango tree. I said, what? He said, it's filled with green mambas, poisonous snakes. In fact, we parked our car underneath the tree, and two green mambas fell out on top of the hood of the car. And one, I had my hand, he said, I had my hand on top of the roof, and the green mamba fell almost on my hand, and I was just, we're terrified. This tree is infested with snakes. And next door, they're doing a construction project. There was kind of a marshy area next door to our home, home on the other side of the fence. And they're going to be building there, and so they're clearing out all the marsh. And a 16-foot boa constructor came out into our yard. I'm like, whoa, whoa. And I said, were you not aware of all these snakes? And I said, no, I was never conscious of snakes. Now, I have to say, there were probably snakes all around me. But I wasn't aware or afraid or conscious. So you see how it shifts everything? And suddenly now you're like, snakes are everywhere. Snakes are everywhere. I know there's snakes here. There's snakes all over. And suddenly become, they become snakes. They begin to see snakes every single where they went. You see, it all depends upon what your consciousness is. How many of you found yourself in a spirit of naivete, maybe, and you've gone out and done something that someone said, whoa, that was pretty risky. And you go, it was risky? I didn't even think of it that way. I didn't think that I might be in danger. I didn't think that there might be a problem. I didn't think this would cause an issue. You see? It, nothing unfolds for us unless we are really seeing it in consciousness. So it is that everything that touches our life must touch through the awareness of our consciousness. And that's the Spirit of God. Because I'm going to tell you this. 
How many of you are aware the Spirit of God is moving right now? How many of you are aware that God wants to heal, work, manifest? And we were like, oh, I'm so busy doing church. I'm busy having this experience. I'm busy here. I didn't really think. God speaking to me right now? That's right. I, I really wasn't thinking that way. I wasn't conscious of that. Everything will touch our lives through the awareness of this alert mind, consciousness that's awakened to say, I know God is speaking in this moment. We live in a three-dimensional world. You know what that is? You know, it's quite often three dimensions. We've got the length. We've got the width. We've got the height. We think of everything in a physical realm, right? We live in this three-dimensional world, so we're constantly thinking from a three-dimensional perspective. But Jesus invited you to see the world in the fourth dimension. That's right. Jesus was quite advanced in science. What? When did he talk about the fourth dimension? I don't know any scripture that's quoting that. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is within. And he spoke about this wonderful dwelling of God within us. A fourth dimension of understanding that we may look in a spiritual world and see spiritual things taking place. It offers us this great insight. So we welcome something that is doesn't necessarily always be outside of us, but it's something that's happening within us. We begin to see things. That's why we live and operate and believe and preach and teach a metaphysical teaching. What is meta? Beyond the physical. Because let me tell you this. If we're coming to church, and if all of our religion is just all about the physical realm, whoo, a lot of hassles, a lot of limitations, a lot of shortcomings, right? Because the limitations of this world are found in the length, the width, and the height. That's all. But when we awaken that Jesus invited you to live spiritually, metaphysically, beyond the physical, to begin to see and embrace all that which is metaphysical, that which is there, and to welcome it and say, Karibu, welcome to this wonderful experience of seeing now the divine at work within us, that we suddenly begin to look for things not outside of our life, but things within our life. We look to see things inside of us, and we see how they're unfolding within us. We see grace at work within, love at work, within peace at work within we may be looking for all those things outside and we can't find them but when we're living and operating from that spiritual realm we find this wonderful unfolding of that inward work and that inward world it comes from the center to the circumference of it from the center out it goes this full awareness it says God in me, the divine in me, the kingdom of heaven within me, the presence of God within me, however you like to describe it, is there and it's from my center. It's radiating outward. It's going outward in a way that is transformational. It is flowing from me. As we may think and expect everything to come to us, it begins as it flows from us. So I am through my consciousness, I have access to this kingdom that's within, this power, this presence, this insight, this wisdom, this understanding, this unfolding of great truth. Now, today's text, you read it. You may be familiar with it. You may have seen the picture of Jesus knocking on the door, that text below it saying, I stand at the door and knock. The translation really means I stand at the door of your consciousness and I'm knocking. Hody. Hody, Hody, waiting for you to say, draw near. Not to come from without, but to rise, welcome, to rise in our thought. It says, I stand at the door of your consciousness, your awareness, and I knock. Not only am I come that you might have life more abundantly, but for those who will, who will come, they will uh, express and experience this wonderful thing that I will come to him and eat with them and them with me. When we welcome this divine presence in, what happened is get ready to feast. Get ready to feast. 
the goodness of God is going to unfold for you. The truth of God is going to unfold for you. Suddenly, your whole life is going to be transformed because suddenly now you're thinking God thoughts. And you're going to be feasting on truth, wisdom, insight that there for you. I love this text because it says, I will sup with you or eat with you in different translations. Well, what are we going to eat with this divine spirit in the spiritual world? Are we going to have pizza together? Are God and I going to have, you know, lasagna? You know, veal parmesan? Oh, certainly, right, right, if you're Italian. Uh, there you go, Joanne. Uh huh. What, what will it be? Will it? Is it going to be a vegan meal? Uh, you know, what will I be eating with God? What will I partake? You know, I mean, what does God like? Does God like steak? Good dog, you know, does God like ham? Oh, could be kosher. Uh, you know, <laughs> so we look at this kind of thing, and we got to move away from the physical. The whole unfolding is that God will eat of the truth, the bread of new understanding. The truth symbolized by bread. Jesus broke bread and he gave it to them. He's breaking bread constantly. The spirit of God is unfolding bread, which is symbolized by truth or bread symbolizing truth for us, that we might eat of this truth for the spirit of God is going to share this truth with you. For in the great tradition of Eastern living and Eastern culture, it would be so that many times there would be a piece of bread and someone would tear from that loaf or that that pita bread or whatever it may have been in their cultural time, tear off and hand it to someone else and actually feed someone else. Even in this, this story of the Last Supper, that there would be those who would dip that bread in that sup and they would pass it to a next person and feed one another. Today's culture, like, Ooh, we're like, I got space issues. Don't be coming at me with a fork. Don't be coming at me with your dirty hands. Did you wash them hands? You know, what are you doing before you start feeding me and start putting something in my mouth? You see, we have evolved so far away from the understanding of this wonderful thing of the divine feeding us, the bread of truth, the divine feeding us and say, here, I pour this partake, I, this I give unto you. What do we sing this morning? Give us this day our daily bread. That's what we just sang, that prayer. Did we mean anything? Did it mean anything to us? What it was saying is give us this day that which sustains us, nurtures us, and strengthens us. That's truth, wisdom, insight, the spirit speaking, leading, guiding. That's what we partake of. And when we sing this and when we pray this prayer, we're constantly saying give us this day our daily bread. Give us that which we need for this day. Every day we need this new fresh feeding, this new truth, understanding being given to us. So it is that understanding this wonderful truth of this passage then is that the spirit is knocking on your consciousness and asking you, will you let me in? Not inside, or it's already in, but into the higher level of your thinking. That every moment, I am having God thoughts. I'm having God thoughts right now. I know exactly what to do. I know exactly where to go. God thoughts are filling my, my consciousness. The Spirit is leading and directing me, not in a controlling way, but guiding me with tap, tap with the rod or the staff, showing me the greener pastures and still water, shall we say, of the day-to-day -day living of my life. How many of you know the song? Somebody's knocking at your door. Somebody's knocking at your door. Oh, children, why don't you answer? Somebody's knocking at your door. Somebody's knocking at your door. Sing it with me. Somebody's knocking at your door. Oh, children, why don't you answer? Somebody's knocking at your door. Amen. Somebody's knocking at your door. It's the Spirit of God. Amen.